and uh, looking forward to these races. So let's have a look at the location here this weekend. So 25 kilometres out of this Melbourne CBD in Victoria, we find our way down to Springvale to a joint user facility that involves karting and, uh, should I say, horse racing and car racing. I'll get my words together this morning. And uh, what a lovely location this is, and it's been around for a long period of time. It's been a very successful, great theatre for motorsport over the journey, and we've seen some classic battles here. It's been fantastic. Thanks to Pizza Hut. Let's check out the details of this racetrack. 3.1 kilometres around here, 13 turns, very fast straights, 260 plus kilometres per hour on a northerly and southerly direction. That back straight is a real drag race where the timing in sector two gives you a bit of an idea of the straight line performance and the aero behavior of the cars and what levels of straight line performance they've got relative to each of the brands. We're going to study all that in great detail. The best part about this this weekend and for our next event at the Repco Bathurst 1000 is the field size effectively doubles. So we've got a couple of wildcard entries in here as well. And from our regular 24 drivers, it's not just 48, it's actually 52. So 52 drivers, a whole lot of familiar names come back to talk to us and see us. Many of them are big names that we've celebrated before. There's a lot of stories to tell. In fact, if you blink in this business, if you've been off the grid for a few weeks, you come back and go, what on earth is going on? There are so many stories up and down the pit lane. So let's get started with some of them now. Say a very good morning again to Chad. Yeah, good day, Neil. The biggest news to break off the back of Tasmania has to be that Brody Kostecki, the reigning champion, has decided where his new home will be for 2025, and it's the garage where I'm standing right now. Shell V Power Racing have snapped up Brody Kostecki. That means Anton Di Pasquale is on the move. And in further good news for this team, they've announced a new multi-year deal with Shell, which has first appeared on this car back in 1967. So a 55-year relationship for Dick Johnson and Shell is set to continue. The great man is here in the background as well, so you can really feel the history here at Sandown this week. And as a result of Anton Di Pasquale, he'll be leaving DJR and heading right here next year to Team 18. So that news broke in recent weeks. What does that mean for Mark Winterbottom? Well, he is out of the seat here next year. Where will he land? The former champion. There's question marks around Premier Newell on Racing. There's question marks around Brad Jones Racing. So the music starts again. When it stops, where will everyone finish? Now, Crompo, you just mentioned the volume of vehicles here, usually 24, 26, and they're made up. I'm right down the other end of pit lane with our two wild cards. So you've got Craig Lowndes and Cooper Murray uh, in the 888 entry and in the, um, in the Charter entry, Matt Charter, Brad Vaughan in the beautiful-looking Boost Mobile Camaro. Now, they're not associated. In fact, that Camaro is the car that won last year with Wing Cup and Feeney in it. But think of the complications. Because there's two cars, garages they've got to share under the rules, they're going to share personnel doing the pit stops. These guys will have their guys on the rear and then Triple Eight will provide the rest of the crew. But just think about the complications of that. Just another one to throw into the mix. Yeah, there are so many stories that have unfolded since we last raced in Tasmania down at Simmons Plains Raceway, just outside Launceston. Lots of things to detail and we're going to pick that all apart for you throughout the weekend and especially great to welcome Boost Mobile onto this car. Armand Charter's entry with young Brad Vaughan and Matt Charter, who we've regularly seen doing well in Dunlop Super 2 over a period of time. We saw some images while the pit reporters were talking to us there a few moments ago of the spectacular livery on the Penrite racing cars and that Payne's vehicle looked like it was hemorrhaging something. So we'll go down to Chad see if we get an update on this. Yeah, Neil, unfortunately the 19 isn't going as good as it's looking and it's a power steering issue for this car. So they're bringing it straight back into the garage. They're going to try and diagnose exactly what it is. Hopefully it might just be an oil issue and they can get this car back out. They're hopefully not going to change uh, the entire power steering unit. They're going to park it out the front to begin with here and go to work on it. Now remember, if you go back to Sydney, these guys had an issue in the very first practice session which was engine related on that occasion. They ended up winning that very first race that weekend. So might not necessarily necessarily be a bad omen for the all in blue Penrite Racing number 19. Celebrating the presentation and the livery of the great Alan Moffat and the Brute Falcon that's actually on display uh, celebrating victory from back in 1974. So special moment for Penrite this weekend because this is the Penrite Oil Sandown 500. Garth Candy you saw a glimpse of a moment ago. He's not in the broadcast team this weekend. He's driving with young Matt. How's the Extraordinary difference in experience. 47 races under the belt of Matt Payne. 644 for Garth Tander. Up at the northern end of the racetrack now. And uh, there's been a couple of little changes as Mark Skate comes back into the entry box. One of them is right there on the inside of turn nine, which we refer to as Danny Nong Road. 
So there's a little concrete apron there that's changed that. Also turn four and turn seven. So story here is we're looking at Will Brown and Jess and Mark have already had some conversation around this. So what a great performance it's been so far this year. And the hallmark of his championship has been consistency. So there's been a swag of podiums. And if you look at that mix, Mark Scaife, it's seriously impressive. 14 against his name across a range of wins, seconds, and third placings. So very rarely has he dropped the ball throughout the championship season. So he's been in very, very good shape. And he's co-driving this weekend with Scott Pies at the helm at the moment. And that's Andrew Edwards, the engineer in the foreground. So Scott's been in the background doing drive days and spending a lot of time with this team. Remember, he had a full-time ride with this organisation, uh, Team 18, further down the road. And uh, so he's just picked up this ride in 2024. And it's a big opportunity for him in these Enduros. Now, this is the story also that we're watching very keenly to see whether or not these guys are off for and ready United over one off the century of Chas Boston and combined with Lee Holdsworth this weekend can continue their points march. So Chaz has got three victories to his name so far this year, and he has been super, super strong, hasn't he? So you talked about it with Jess just a few moments ago. Yeah, his consistency this year, Neil, has been the thing that I've been really impressed by. And the, I think the change of engineering personnel and the way he's applied himself has been a new level for Chaz Mostert. And the team obviously reacted very well to that as they've continued to bridge this gap to the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team. The other part that's interesting is the way that Red Bull decided to run the start of this session because they put the co-drivers in immediately. Unlike a lot of the other teams, they put their main driver in just to make sure that the car's okay. But they've done the opposite. And uh, for Scott Pye to be in there and Jamie Winkup, and just about to, you saw there before, Will Brown with his helmet on to put Will inside with the seven-time champion. Pretty handy with Winkup and Feeney with their performance here last year. And as you can see, that's that little piece of the inside curb that you made uh, relevance to. The, the inside there is a, probably about a metre or a metre and a half wide, the, the concrete infill at turn nine and turn four. And that probably should increase that pace across the apex there at Great Shot. Thank you, guys. So that's a, that's a big change. That will actually make a lot of difference to the mid-corner speed at that spot. That's Dandenong Road, and the other one is turn four, leading onto the back straight. So that's why the pace is so strong straight away. That's a nine dead for Mark Winterbottom. That's a really good lap time early. Okay, you raise a good point. I might just grab Brock Feeney. We're just saying, Brock, uh, so many of the teams putting out their main drivers. Isn't it nice when you can be here as the main driver and send Jamie Link up out? What's the plan there? I'm the co-driver, like, uh, uh, yeah, no, obviously we got two good co-drivers, but um, just how the sessions work today, want to obviously focus on the race on Sunday and, and giving Jamie some laps um, to start off. So I'll jump in at the end, um, just make sure everything's all good, and then, um, yeah, he's in for his co-driver session. Just very quickly, it's a beautiful thing to have a co-driver here. It's ill, doesn't it? Because weather changes, all the rest of it just gives you flexibility and strategy. Yeah, 100%. I mean, um, there's obviously lots of options come Sunday's race, but we got... Heaps of flexibility with Jamie, and obviously for me, he's, he's done it plenty of times here before. He's a sand down guru, so I've um, got plenty of knowledge to lean on, and um, yeah, hopefully come Sunday, Arbor, we're in a good spot. Good stuff. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah, he's uh, certainly got a very handy co-driver to work with this weekend. Now, just in terms of pace, Neil, practice one last year, Brock Feeney was fastest with a 9-2-9. So a 9-0 for Mark Winterbottom is almost three tenths of a second faster straight away. So the pace is immediate. Pretty handy conditions out there at the moment. It's about 14 degrees, uh, fairly solid cloud cover, but not a lot of wind. Uh, and the wind affects performance here. And typically we've either had howling southerlies or southwesterlies here. There's a little bit from the southwest at the moment, which is a tiny bit of headwind on the front straight. Uh, or in the warmer time of the year, you'll get a roaring northerly here on the coast as well as we up on the Monster Energy uh, Mustang. It's interesting just looking, there's been some exploratory laps and everybody's now come back into the pits, give or take about four or five cars out there. They've just done their install laps just to make sure that systems are all good. And we saw that issue before with the Penride entry for Matt Payne. But quite a different combination, Mark, of uh, primary and co-drivers out there. Also, there's a smattering of, of co-drivers that have had a bit of a lunge. But the standard procedure has often been just to go and get a benchmark understanding of what the car's capable of doing. And 
how well matched to the road it is. And even in the conversation while you were talking a few moments ago, I could hear Chas Mostert just giving them a download on the radio about the behaviour of his car. So they want to get an understanding, a bit of a reference, and then uh, we've got a lot of practice sessions this weekend on paper. It looks fine for us. When you're actually in the garages, they evaporate very fast, but there's a dedicated co-driver session coming up a little bit later in the broadcast today. But early days in an enduro like this, and there's James Moffat, and he'll be partnered with Cam Waters this week. They had a shocking run here last year, and in fact at Bathurst, so they'll be looking for a big turnaround in the enduros this year. But the aim of the game is procedure in these practice setup days to get both drivers comfortable, so they want to be able to have flexibility to be able to get them both in and out of the car, to have good solid lap speed across both drivers, an understanding of cause and effect with the behaviour of the car, if you've got certain things going on with the weather or the competition or the track situation, the grip levels of the road, what are the tools that you've got up your sleeve in order to be able to correct that when they make stops, and we're going to see a lot of that. So the play changes dramatically. I think where I'm driving with this is the tempo of the race meeting is a very, very different proposition to the sprint racing that we've largely seen so far this year. Dean Fiore pairing up with Jackson Evans in the SCT Logistics car. You were given the honours to do the first couple of laps. How was that? It was great, actually. Really good fun to get back into it. Um, Jackson wants to do a practice start at the end, so I thought I'd just get the cobwebs out early and then Jackson will run this session out. You did a few runs earlier in the year in the Dunlop Super 2. How important is that just to get your, get your mind into gear, get away from the office and get back in the car? Yeah, it's always hard to sort of snap out of business mode in, into racing mode. Um, to be honest, I'm so focused on that stuff when I'm, when I'm in it, but I just love coming back to this motor work, motorsport world and um, being back in the BJR fold is, is great. And if we don't recognise the car that this weekend, it's because it's red. Very different livery, celebrating 50 years. Tell us about that. Oh, we just wanted it red because Ferrari and it goes fast. Um, <laughs> basically, SCT um, Logistics, 50 years in business. Um, it's enormous. Uh, so many people. I think over 2,000 people um, employed in this country. Um, in the world. So it's an extraordinary effort and the car looks mint. So it's really good to honour that. Absolutely does. And red goes faster. We all know that. Thanks, Dino. Cheers. Dan Fiori teaming up with Fast Kiwi. Jackson Evans has had a busy year internationally this year. Quite a few different delivery presentations this weekend. This is one of them. Yulon Cars have also got some different presentation, and we'll have a look at that through the coverage. And we talked earlier about the Penrite racing cars as well. Dean's back with BJR, Dean Fiore, that we just heard from again. There is one of the two Yulon Cars, uh, Tim Slade, will be driving with Cam McLeod. And one of the things that's fun this weekend, Mark, and if you cast your mind back to your junior days in the category. San Am is often the place where people get their first mark on the board. Yep. And so you look at the people that are rookies here this weekend. We've got both San Am 500 rookies, but we've got genuine Repco Supercars Championship rookies that are only turning their first wheel now. Invariably, they've all done lots of cool things, and they've actually been part of the racing community through many of the support categories. So they're not necessarily new to the business, but they're new to supercars. So it's a really big moment for a whole pile of people out there yep. to get onto the main stage, to pair up with the big names and to do their thing. So Cam McLeod is one of those. And he's been very successful. He's done a lot of things. He's got a lot of racing under his belt. So he's got a big weekend ahead paired with Tim. It is a great opportunity, isn't it? And it's a lot about the prestige. You know, we're celebrating 60 years of this event this year. And when you cast your mind back and you look at some of the names that have won, and it's always been the precursor to Bathurst. So for those young people to get their first ride and to be in the highest level, this is such a competitive series, to be in against the highest level guys, like a Wing Cup, for instance, is a great opportunity. I've come down to Erebus to check out what the goss is down here for this session. I can see Jaden Ojeda, he's wearing his everyday clothing, as is Todd Hazelwood. So that's a pretty good sign that neither of the Erebus co-drivers are going to do some laps as they send the power play number one car back out there. Cool to be back at Erebus. You're obviously a big part of the team at the beginning of the year, Todd. You must be hanging to do some laps. Yeah, exactly. No, it's fantastic to be back with the team here at Erebus. We've got power play on board for this weekend on a number one rocket. So, yeah, great to be teaming up with Brody as well. You know, we are good friends from a long way back. So, you know, for me personally, it's my best opportunity ever come into the enduro season, so you know, keen as mustard to get stuck in and see what we can achieve, obviously. You didn't get number one on the car at the beginning of the year, did you? You had to, had to wait for it to be this week. What's it like driving around with the number one on it? Yeah, I did my first signature the other day of number one. Oh, that feels a bit weird, but uh, it's a nice problem to have. I'll take it, right? But, um, yeah, obviously, yeah, 
you know, to, to team up with Bush, come into two, these two rounds. You know, we saw last year, he was on the front row, you know, in race winning contention for both of those events. And certainly feels like Erebus is starting to find their form again in the last couple of events. We saw at Tasmania that both cars inside the top five over the course of the weekend. And you can certainly draw parallels to cars set up with Tasmania and Sandown. So certainly hoping that that's the case for this weekend and the cars are rolled out pretty strong so far. Yeah, very strong co-driver lineup. And Jack LeBrock's just gone out in a new set of tyres as well. Tommy Randall's vehicle right behind me, this Tickford Mustang. Now, before I talk to his co-driver, Tyler Everingham, a couple of things I want to just point out. If you look at the cars and you're wondering who's driving them, often their names are up here. A bit of an awkward spot, but you'll see them up there across the top of the vehicle. But look at the livery on this vehicle. Very, very cool. Now, I understand this comes from a Gran Turismo gaming car. Now, Crompo Escaping, we're big gamers, big in the video world. Best I ask, Tyler, have you... <laughs> the guys thought, yeah, we don't do the video thing <laughs> at all. You do. Tell us about the livery. And, Tyler, I'm also keen to hear your expectations for this weekend. Um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, pretty cool take on uh, a Super that ran in the, the Japanese touring car series. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool to see it on the, on the Mustang here this weekend. Um, yeah, look, coming into this weekend, I haven't really done a lot of driving this year, so um, we've come off a pretty good test at Winton, so, uh, yeah, sort of just looking forward to getting in the car here and, and seeing what it's like. I mean, from an old bloke to a young bloke, one of the things we see repeatedly is if you can go from one end of this race with Tyler to the other, mistake-free, not suggesting you make mistakes, mistake-free, usually there's a good result for you. That's got to be a target. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we're, uh, I think we're pretty pacey on the test day. So, um, yeah, like you said, just minimize mistakes and, and see where we end up. Best of luck, buddy. Thank you. Great opportunity for Tyler this weekend. 13th in the Sandown 500 last year, pairing with Thomas Randall. And that really smart presentation on car number 55, another of cars that's been rewrapped coming into this weekend. I think Tyler did the Bathurst six-hour production race earlier in the year. Hasn't done a huge amount of racing, but Thomas said to me earlier that he was super quick at the recent test day that they had up at Winton. In fact, pretty much everybody with the exception of Newlon Racing has gone and done some testing either at Queensland Raceway for the Brisbane and the Gold Coast-based teams or at Winton for those that are based in Victoria. So there's been a flurry of activity since Tasmania as well. Car looks awesome, doesn't it? Just the yeah. presentation is wicked. So uh, speed is a topic out there at the moment. There's plenty of it, Mark. So we've got Mark Winterbottom at the top. You've already pointed out the relative speed compared to last year. So a one minute 9.0 for Mark Winterbottom. He's got six one hundreds over Andre Heingarten and Chaz Moster. As I mentioned before, he's doing a pretty lengthy debrief on the radio and he's jumped in speedily as well up into a 9-1 for position number three. Then LeBrock and Perkat, who was victorious in Tasmania last time out. Will Brown got on the podium there as well, Cam Hill. Those Matt Stone racing cars were very strong down in Tassie. Tony Delberto continues what has been a very long and successful partnership with the Shelby Power Racing team. Uh, he's in car number 11 with Anton Di Pasquale. And how's the list, which I was alluding to before, you and I have not had extended conversation on this, but what an extraordinary period in the gap from Tassie to here to look at the roll call of changes yeah. and it's silly season manoeuvring. So Brody Kostecki is off to Dick Johnson Racing in 25. Anton Di Pasquale joins Team 18 in 25. Mark Winterbottom, as Reece said before, question mark, and he's out there in the marketplace. Cooper Murray joins Erebus in 2025. He's out there with Craig Lowndes this weekend. Meantime, Troy Bundy's been appointed as the Chief Executive of uh, uh, Grove Racing. Uh, so there's just a whole bunch of things. One of the other things, there's some technical stuff that's changed as well. So the flow rates for refueling the cars is going to be dramatically different this weekend to what it was in the endurance races last year. So there are a lot of points to talk about. Let's get on with it again with Chad. Uh, just down at Grove Racing, speaking of Troy Bundy, and the team told me that everything's all good with car 19. It was just a fitting issue with the power steering, but this car's now come back into the pits and it still reeks of pungent oil down here. You can see the team working away at trying to bleed some of that out right now. So. It is one part making just some small little setups and a quick chat with Matt inside the car, but it's still a little bit of work to go on to make sure it's not dropping fluid. You don't want that. I mean, it's disruptive in the garage and there would have been a run plan for how they wanted to execute this session and that's now gone out the window. It's frustrating. And uh, even though there are five practice sessions leading into the race on Sunday, 161 laps, you need every one of those minutes, every one of those laps in order to be able to acquire data. Because one of the things, Mark, that I think is important about this weekend, and we've seen the rhythm change in the San Antonio 500 and the Bathurst 1000 over the years, so last year's Bathurst was effectively a race that was determined 
by management of tyres as distinct from running to a fuel-based strategy. But here, with the Dunlop Super Soft tyre on the cars this weekend, it'll revert to being a similar scenario to Bathurst last year, although for Bathurst in 24, we've gone back to the harder tyre, so that it'll flip the consequences of how that race is managed strategically. There's that change of the curving on the inside there of Turn 4 as well. So, because of that, there's a lot of interesting data to be able to acquire in these practice sessions. And in particular, everybody's going to want to know all the standard stuff about the A and B driver compatibility and how they both look after the tyres, because there's always differences. But they're particularly going to be focused on just what they can get out of those tyres. And that'll feed into how their stop plan looks for Sunday, which is currently forecast to be a dry day. And that's what's going on out there at the moment. So they'll be understanding tyre behaviour and wear and degradation. They'll be understanding what, ha what is happening with brakes. And I saw brake change rehearsals being done yesterday in pit stop practice. They'll be understanding fuel consumption, but the particular out of the little list of things that I've just done, tyres and driver compatibility is going to be a very big primary objective to understand off the back of these first few sessions, because that'll start to form the tactical play for the rest of the weekend, and then that'll also determine their run plans for subsequent practice sessions. Well, and probably all of the things that you've just raised, they all get to a point where you mitigate the risks. So you're trying to make the, the minimal mistakes through the race in terms of the driver and team, but some of those things are out of your control sometimes because of safety car and other issues. And one of the things I saw yesterday, Neil, was a huge amount of driver changes going on because that fuel rate change that you spoke of has put more demand on making the driver changes as efficient as it probably used to be. The cars are harder to get in and out because of the glass house size and the way that the car is configured in terms of how far you sit across to the centre of, of, the, of the vehicle. So when you think about doing a co-driver change, especially on an anti-clockwise racetrack, you've got to get out in the congested garage um, side of the car. So at Bathurst, it's a lot easier on the open side to get out into pit lane effectively. On this occasion, it's a much harder scenario to change drivers. Reynolds now at the top. He's got into the eights. Oh, no, no, you can see that on the totem on the top left-hand corner of the screen. And there is David in the tradie beer entry. He's driving with Warren Luff, one of the most experienced set of hands in the paddock. Car number 20 this weekend. So good opening account from both the Team 18 cars. Looking like they've got some pretty decent speed at the moment. They're only separated in peak speed by seven one hundredths of a second. Uh, good to see also no telltale signs of smoke from Matt Payne's car there a few moments ago. But they've sacrificed the best part of the first 20 minutes of the session. So that compromise that we spoke of, a little bit frustrating for them as we have a look at yet another of the new combinations. The 26 pairings, 54 drivers. Continuity represents seven pairings only in this field. New pairings, 19. And that just tells you something. I mean, there are a lot of familiar faces, but it tells you a lot about the way the paddock works, where the quest to be the best just never changes. Yep. And they will do whatever it takes to pair up to get the right combos to try and get this job done. And so uh, this is another really interesting lineup here. Car number 10, I talked before about Nick Perkett being so strong in Tassie. He's uh, driving with Dylan O'Keefe. Dylan's been very busy this year in Carrera Cup. And he's got a lot of experience. You don't see him in supercars as frequently, but he's got a lot of seat time going at the moment. And so that'll be a powerful combination. Crumping about Nick Perkett and Dylan O'Keefe pairing up for this weekend. You guys didn't know much about each other before becoming co-drivers. Tell me how you've been getting to know each other. Um, we attended some golf, a lot of swearing. Um, yeah, just generally, um, yeah, we, when we got to MSR together, we're hanging out for a couple of days up there, played a round of golf, and um, he's pretty easy to get along with. He's, um, yeah, he's a good guy, so it's it's been super simple. So, um, yeah, it's cool all year, obviously, watching him in the Porsche, and then he's been he's been around the team since the Grand Prix, to be honest, so it's um, it's pretty easy. A bit like speed dating. You've got to get to know each other really quickly. Uh, you've done a few laps in the car. How's things this morning? Yeah, car ride out really well. I think, you know, all top three there, and some people put some tyres on and stuff like that, so... But that, for us today, it's purely the race car. It's a long, long race. Um, and, yeah, making sure we've got good tyre life and um, just a comfortable balance. So, it, yeah, it rolled out in, with full of fuel and some race stuff on it, and it was, it was good. Thanks, Nick. Wish you the best for the weekend. Thank you.
Neil, you made some good points there about car setup. You know, an important part, particularly for the co-driver. And I just watch right now. So Will Davidson's come in. Different set of rear shocks, springs, different set of front shock springs, which is a quite a big change. And as you guys well know, here at Sandown, short pointy corners. So you need the car to be pointy. You need it to steer from the front really well, which can make it a little nervous. So sometimes a cute car that's fast is antagonistic to comfortable car for co-driver. The co-driver in here, and I think we should try and meet him as often as we could. This young Kai Allen, good style of a young kid, I like him. I think he's won four or five races, maybe in uh, Super 2. Don't know if he's future championship material yet, but I want to have a quick yarn to him. Got a full-time gig next year at Groves. He's earned that gig. Just watch him. We'll do a lot of changes, mate. Talking about how important that fast car is for you to drive comfortably. Yeah, it's pretty important. I think, you know, Will's getting a bit of a read on it now before I go out in the co-driver session, so I get a good read because, you know, I don't get many laps in that. I've done my super well, well, but it's a completely different driving style. So, um, yeah, see where he ends up here. Doing, trying to get, you know, it's the session starting to get, you know, run out. So, um, see how he goes and, yeah, try and get it ready for me with the co-driver session. And no pressure for you, mate. But an important couple of weekends at the endurance races because you're going to Penrite Racing next year. That's a big move for a young bloke. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think, you know, limited experience in the Gen 3, but um, no, I'm looking forward to it. I think, you know, we've got a, we've got a good shot in the enduros this year. Will's been really good and the team's great. So, I'm looking forward to that. And then, um, yeah, hopefully I can prep for yeah, next year. We're all looking forward to it, mate. Well done. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Got the two Team 18 cars inside the top three. Dave's back out of the car, so a good chance to just hear what it's like out there for the, uh, the early part of this session. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. The track's obviously a bit dirty, a bit dusty, but um, there's some new surfaces gone down with some concrete infills, which is you know unusual for us, and it, you've got to learn to use it, otherwise you're giving away metres of the track. But, uh, yeah, everything's going OK. You know, it's very early days, and... Um, yeah, we'll see how we end up. No one's ever had a bad word to say about sharing a car with Warren Laugh. Are you finding that experience out yourself? Yeah, we're having a great time. Like, heaps of laughs, constant jokes. Uh, but, you know, he's a serious competitor and I've known him for a long time and he's probably one of the best co-drivers in our sport. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to share a car with him. Won the co-driver lottery, mate. Best luck for the weekend. All right, thanks, boys. See some of those stats on the left-hand side there. And Luffy as he's affectionately known, has had a couple of wins at this lo location with both Craig Lowndes and Garth Tander. Five times he's been on the podium and he's had a remarkable record at Bathurst as well. So uh, he will be very solid around here. There'll be a huge amount of muscle memory in his repertoire out there at the moment. He'll be doing pretty well. Meantime, Chas Boston, Lee Holdsworth have gone to the top on 8-8-9. Uh, eight, eight, Practice record was achieved last year by Brock Feeney, got down to an 8-5, practice four on Saturday. So already they're going quickly, and right now as we pick up on Cam Waters, he's just further moved that marker to an 8-0, a one minute 8.8065. 8, he's got eight one hundreds over car number 25 at the moment. And we're expecting to see some pretty tight competition between these top teams, even as early as these practice sessions. There was also a shot there a few moments ago on the Richie Stanaway car, so that's another of the new driving pairings this weekend. He's with Dale Wood. And we're just also picking up on the inside curb there at turn one for Jack LeBrock. And you see the body language of what it does when you upset the car and you use that outside curb like a motocross berm to try to contain the slide. He ended up straddling that. Sometimes you can do some damage to the undercarriage of the car when you've got both wheels on either side of that big curb on the outside. And he won't be the only one through the course of the weekend to have done that. There'll be cars off the road down there, as we always see. A lot of it's to do with all those surface changes and also a lot to do with the bumps on the way in. Have a look at all those bumps there on those surface changes. Cars need to ride those nicely. And what Larko was talking about in terms of having a pointy car, that's 100%. But you've also got to make the car supple enough to ride those bumps and ride the kerbs. And the infills at turn four and turn nine that Dave Reynolds just spoke about probably put a bigger component of kerb usage than even we had last year. We're inside one minute now before the checkered flag comes out in this first of five practice sessions this weekend. We will have Boost Mobile qualifying that leads to a Boost Mobile top 10 shootout, 161 laps of hardcore racing. Craig Lowndes doing a little bit of Craig Lowndes out there on the exit of turn one. Car triple eight. So he's a lunatic, isn't he? Is. <laughs> Nothing changes. Uh, we had some uh, nice images there a few moments ago. The SP seconds. Tools livery on Cam Hill's car as well, and he's paired up with Cam Crick, another of the new combinations. Now, Waters is pressing on here as we pick him up the northern end of the racetrack. He's gone fastest in the first sector, personal best in the mid sector, so he's hustling on decent tyres here. He might improve on this 8 8 into this final complex. Now, the thing about Sandown, and you'll get 
a very clear indication of this in the onboard camera here at the moment is it's not just a question of talking about the bumps here. Check it's the fact that it's different from side Phoenix to side is as that number closed. moves now to an 8-7 for Cam Waters, and he's got a 0.14, and that's James Moffat, his co-driver, watching in the background. He'll be comfortable with seeing those numbers pop up. Here's the sister car, number 55. This is the Thomas Rander, Tyler Everingham entry. So Sandow's notorious but not only making the cars move around, but they move around side to side. They pitch and roll under brakes. Mark Larkin was talking before about that short, sharp notion of the brake turn, fire it off in another direction. And it's a real challenge to set up for. Very, very different to the majority of the tracks that we visit. Randall up to P4 on that number, by the way, did an 8-9. Here's the replay of Craig Lowndes in action. It understeered wide at turn one, up and over and up onto two wheels, cresting the top of the kerb there. And he is down in 22nd position. He's done a 9-7. Different people will have done different things with fuel loads and uh, tyre condition there as well. Little wild moment here for Ryan Wood down at turn nine. He's ended up just outside the top ten at... Uh, personal best first and second sector and in fact I reckon on that lap where he did the personal best was where he messed up down there at the bottom of Danny Nong Road. One minute 8.7 ends up being the number that sets the agenda early in the game. It's very very close to record breaking speed from practice last year but a good solid session and uh, most number of laps I'm scanning down the list at the moment so it looks to me as though car 88 the Brock Feeney Jamie Wind Cup car was the car that achieved the most and it's got 20 laps against it on the timing. The cars are going back here onto the front straight because they'll do practice starts. There's five minutes allocated for this process. Remembering that the cars are going to be fat with fuel when they launch off the line for the Penrite Oil Sandown 500. And one of the other changes going from year to year is that this year it's been mandated that the primary drivers must start the cars. Pretty short, sharp rundown here to turn one at Sandown. And the other challenge about Sandown, you don't really see it from the shot here with Cam at the moment, but all the way down there on the left-hand side, it narrows up from being whatever that might be, six, seven cars wide, and it narrows up dramatically. So if you find yourself down the inside down there, you can see it. Uh, you end up running out of road. We've seen more than one competitor down there getting squeezed up onto the curb from time to time. and launch them off the line when they've got warm tyres out there at the moment. But uh, just finding a settled position, getting the car into the right spot, getting the line locker on it, which is effectively like a handbrake, finding the bite point on the clutch, setting that throttle percentage. Well, I've all been rehearsing this at both Queensland Raceway and at Winton recently. And clearly it's going to dictate the way in which things work in the first few laps of this race. Getting away cleanly at the start of these races with a big pile of fuel on is very important. And as you look at this racetrack, just pay attention to all the different colours of the bitumen and all the different bumps. And you can see it when you jump on board with the drivers. You can see how much wheel work's involved in just trying to steer them around through all this. Great shot looking down the side of the left-hand sill, sill panel here. And you can see that cloud cover that I spoke about in the background earlier as well. So it's come up to about 15 degrees now, but we're fortunate today that we haven't got that biting cold wind Frightening amount of energy gets transferred. Nice start. The trick here is to convert the energy without too much wheel spin and not bogging down. Sounds easy, not so easy to execute. Let's check out the results for you after practice one. It's going to be a long journey leading up to some highly intense racing on Sunday afternoon. Cam Waters and James Moffat get their account open beautifully. Tiny margin across the top three. It's only 0.18 of a second. And you can see those that are on the next page. And as I said before, there'll be a lot of different programs unfolding. So we can't read too much into it at the moment. But 